Good evening. This week we are in the aura of Korach. Now Korach was a villain. And why would we want to be in his aura? And the next follow-up question is, why does the Torah name one of its portions Korach, the name of a villain, a man who rebelled against Moses, and as a result he rebelled against God, who was swallowed up by the earth as a punishment, total villain, and yet a Parsha was named after him. So we have to understand what exactly was Korach's motive, and how could we see some good in Korach? So the truth of the matter is, Korach was not a total rebel. Korach was a very spiritual person. Korach, our sages tell us, he was a very smart person. He was a visionary. He saw things not the way they are, but the way they will be. There's some people who can only see in front of them. They can't see an inch beyond themselves. They're nearsighted. They can only see from near. They can't see from far. There are people who are farsighted. They can only see from far and not from near. Well, Korach was the farsighted one. He saw things in the future. And there were different ways of understanding what exactly was the vision that he saw, but one of the interpretations is that Korach saw into the Messianic age where he re realized that the Levi would be superior to the Kohen. You see, the Jewish people are divided into three classes. Kohen, the priest, Levi, the deputy or the assistants to the priest, the Levites, as they're called in English, and Yisrael, the Israelites. Most Jews are Israelites, but there are some who are either Kohen or Levi. And the way this hierarchy works is that Kohen is the highest, Levi is an assistant, a deputy. They helped the Kohanim in the temple, but they were not considered as holy as the Kohen. And Korach saw into the future in the Messianic age where the Levi will be higher than the Kohen. The way that's understood in Kabbalistic literature is the Kohen represents the attribute of chesed, of kindness, the flow of spiritual energy into this world. This world is a very unrefined world, and the ultimate goal is that the world will become refined. Now, there are two approaches. One approach is to just shower it with holiness, with positive energy, but the, the shortcoming of that is that it's only peripheral. The world itself will not necessarily change because the negativity, negative energy is entrenched into the world itself. So you need the Levi who represents Gevura, judgment, discipline, harshness, where you take the world and you change it, you transform it, you wrestle with it. So which is easier? The first approach is easier. Chesed is easier. We right now don't have the power to be capable of using gvura, this judgment, this harshness, this tenacity, this ability to dig deep into this world and transform it. We have our patriarchs. Abraham was a man of chesed, of kindness. He spread God's knowledge to everyone. He fed everyone physically and spiritually. Yitzchak dug wells. Now, when we try to praise the patriarchs and we say Abraham was a man of kindness and Yitzchak dug wells, well, what does digging wells have to do with anything spiritual, with anything positive? You're not, you're not going to praise someone because they can dig wells. So Hasidic literature explains that digging wells is also a metaphor. Besides the literal meaning, that's how we earned a living, it also means that he dug deep into the earth. 
And that's not easy to get rid of the negativity, to get rid of the evil. You could ameliorate, you could weaken the evil by flowing goodness and kindness and spirituality, but you can't really change it until you use the power of Gvura. We have the dispute between the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. The school of Hillel says in Hanukkah, we light one candle the first night, two the second night, and three the third night, and so on. So we go in ascending order. The school of Shammai says, no, we go in descending order. We start with eight and we go down to one. What are they arguing about? What is the crux of their argument? Here too, Hasidic sources explain that the school of Hillel, Hillel was the paragon of kindness, of love. That's why it says in Ethics of the Fathers, be a student of Aaron who loved peace, who pursued peace and loved everyone. Who says this? Hillel says that. That's Hillel's. Hillel was a man who believed in, like the patriarch Abraham, spread love, like Aaron, spread love. But Shammai comes from the word to evaluate, to assess things. He was a man of gvura, of judgment, of judiciousness, of discipline. That's why when the potential convert came to him and told him he wants to learn the whole Torah, standing on one foot, Hillel embraced this person later on, but Shammai threw him out using the measuring stick used for building, by, by saying, you don't measure up to the standards of Torah. He was, he was harsh because Shammai represents Gevura. So who do we follow? We follow the school of Hillel. Why? Because the school of Hillel is something that we can do. We could get rid of whatever evil we can get rid of by bringing in more light. However, the Arizal, the great Kabbalist, says in the Messianic age, we will follow the school of Shammai. That means we will have the power to go down, eight, seven, six. Why do we go down when we light the Hanukkah candles according to the school of Shammai? Because we start off with getting rid of some evil. The next night we have less evil, so we only have to do seven, then we go down to six until we go down to one. In other words, we have the ability according to the approach and the school and the philosophy and the mindset of the school of Shammai to get, get diminish the evil, to get rid of the evil. And where does Shammai get his idea of going down in descending order? He gets it from the sacrifices and the holiday of Sukkot. When in the temple they would bring 70 sacrifices by starting off with 13, then 12, then 11, they would do it in descending order. And the Talmud tells us that those 70 sacrifices correspond to, correspond to the 70 nations of the world. And these are the 70 nations that represent, among other things, the 70 wolves that encompass and threaten the one lamb, the Jewish people. So what do we do? We weaken their power. We take away their evil. Every day we go downhill. But that's something that we can't do the very well in the present, today, the focus has to be, of course, we do try to fight evil and deal with it, but our main focus has to be Hillel. Hill comes from the word light, bringing more light into the world, more positive energy. Korach, who was a Levi, the Levites were the ones who represent Gvura. Kohen is the man of Chesed. Korach felt that the Levi was superior to the Kohen because he was already, he projected into the future, into the Messianic age, when the Levi's power of judgment will be on the ascendancy, and therefore he claimed that he deserved to be the leader, because that the Levi should be superior and recognized as being superior to the Kohen. And that was what motivated him, motivated him to start this rebellion. So what does this have to do with naming the Parsha Korach? Because Korach's motive was a very positive one. He was into the future. He saw things in the most ideal state. He didn't realize that the time had not yet come. It was a matter of timing. You see, most of the sins we'll find in the Torah, or many of them at least, revolve around bad timing. The sin of this tree of knowledge. What happened there? The tree of knowledge, according to one opinion, was a grapevine. And the commandment not to partake of that fruit was only for three hours until Friday night would be the first Shabbos, the first Sabbath of creation. If they had waited three hours, Adam and Eve, and then they would have used the wine, the grape juice coming from those grapes, to make Kiddush, to sanctify the Shabbos, they would have not only been permitted to do so, it would have been a messianic revelation. It would have brought the world to a state of peace, of Shabbos peace. Alas, they made a mistake and they 
didn't wait those extra three hours. It was a matter of timing, and we can find this with many other things. Last week's parsha, after the saga of the spies, where the Jews cried when they heard they're going to be entering the promised land, and it's a terrible land, they were told by ten of the twelve spies. And then a group of people said to Moses, no, we're going to go, we made a mistake, we sinned, and we're going to go up there. And Moses says, don't go. And they went, and they were killed. What was wrong with going? The timing was wrong. It was not the time. The time for going up had come, but it was they missed the opportunity, and they were going to have to wait another 38 years. So Korach's evil was not that he had evil designs. He wanted to harm some, something that was positive. He wanted to destroy what he wanted. He wanted the world to be in his futuristic state of the messianic age. And that's a positive thing. It's positive. We all should want to live in a messianic age. So Korach represents the ultimate in realizing the future. His problem was that it wasn't the right time. But now it is the right time. That everyone should try to project that they're living in the messianic age. And that itself, by living with Mashiach, as the Rebbe would always emphasize, what does that mean, living with Mashiach? That we live our lives the way we would imagine we're going to be living in the Messianic age. We'll be living a much more wholesome life, a much more pure life, a much more exalted life, a much more spiritual life. Let's live that way right now because we're on the cusp of that, of that age. So by naming the Parsha Korach, we're actually saying, let's follow Korach's intention not his actions. His actions were unwarranted because it wasn't yet the time, but his aspirations to be in the future, it was a positive thing. On a simpler level, Korach wanted to be the high priest. And Rashi quotes that Moses says, you know what? I also would like to be the high priest. We all want to be the high priest. But what can we do? God selected Aaron and his children, not anyone else. Even Moses couldn't be the high priest. So that aspiration is a very good one. It's, there's nothing wrong with someone who says, I would like to be on the highest level of spirituality, which is what a high priest is. But I can't because God didn't make me a high priest. God made me to be a regular priest or a levy or a Yisroel. This is a response and has relevance to the, sometimes we hear women in particular, but it can apply to men as well in other situations, Women would like to do the things that are reserved for men in, in accordance with Jewish law. Women putting on tefillin, women wearing tzitzes, women becoming rabbis, and so on and so forth. And they want, if, they, if their desire is because they want to have the same prominence as men, that men are more in the position of leadership and more externally manifesting themselves, they're more recognized, if that's, that's an undesirable ambition, to, to want to be something because there's more fame, more glory attached to it. But if their intention is pure, as many women are, they want to be more spiritual, they want to be, do things to bring themselves closer to God by having another mitzvah, by putting on tefillin, let's say. That is a very positive aspiration. We should commend them for having that desire have to realize that just because it's commendable to have that desire, we have to know what God's will is. God's will is, no, you're not, you're a woman, and a woman doesn't have the mitzvah to put on tefillin. She doesn't have the mitzvah to wear tzitzes. She doesn't have to be a rabbi, she, not because she is inferior, God forbid, but because she has her role, and according to the Kabbalists and according to many commentators, In Judaism, the women's role is considered to be loftier, higher than the men's role. But at any rate, the intention is commendable. And that's the lesson we learn from naming the Parsha Korach. So let's live with Korach's aspiration to want to reach the highest spiritual levels of a Kohen Gadol, of a high priest. Let us live with the light of Korach who wants to bring us to the Messianic age and make the world a perfect world. And that is something that we should try to emulate. So even though Korach turned out to be a rebel and he was a villain, his intentions were not villainous. According to the Midrash, and Rashi quotes this, Korach challenged Moses. 
And one of his challenges was, if you have a garment that's made out of tchelis, wool dyed with a special dye. Let me, let me just give a little bit of a background for those who are not familiar. The end of last week's Torah portion, the very last paragraph, dealt with the mitzvah of tzitzes, the, the fringes that we put on the four corners of a garment. Now, the way the Torah describes this mitzvah is that we're supposed to put the st- fringes, the strings, on each of the four corners of a four-cornered garment, but we also have to have one thread made out of tchelis, blue dyed wool, and the dye has to come from a certain creature, and there's some controversy whether that creature has been found nowadays, but most Jews who wear the tzitzes do not use the tchelis now. We're waiting for Mashiach to reveal it to us. Some people f- claim that they found it, but that's a separate subject for another occasion. And what do you do with that string? It's dyed blue, and that string is used and tied around the other strings. Now, Korach asked if the talus in its entirety, the prayer shawl, as some people call it, is made out of blue dyed wool. Do you still have to put in tzitzes, a fringe of, of, of blue dyed wool? And Moses says, yes. And Korach mocked that. says, if the fact that the whole talus is made out of this blue dyed wool, which represents a very holy symbol, and if that's not enough, why would adding a little string help? What was Korach's intention? Korach's intention was that the Jewish people are in their entirety, they're holy. They're like a talus that's made out of blue wool. They're all holy. They're all perfect. Why do you need a Moses that's a, like a, a fifth wheel to the wagon? If four wheels aren't enough, what would the fifth wheel add? If you have three wheels, you could say four wheels is more stable. Two wheels, certainly you need four. But if you already have four wheels, why do you need a fifth wheel? That would be a a modern-day application of this argument. What exactly was his argument about? What is the reason we wear tzitzes, that we were given that mitzvah? And and what merit, rather? So there are two different sources. One source says it's because of Abraham. Abraham, when he defeated the people who abducted his nephew Lot and he restored the king of Sodom to his place, the king of Sodom offered to give Abraham gifts. And Abraham said no, he declined. And he said he's not even going to take a thread from him. Not even a thread. Because Abraham rejected the offer of taking the things from the king of Sodom, he didn't want to have any association with that evil king, he was rewarded that his children, his descendants, would have the mitzvah of tzitzes. That's one midrash, one version. Another version is when Noah got drunk and exposed himself, his sons, Shem and Yephes, took a garment and walked backwards and covered him so he shouldn't be exposed. A uh, reward for that was that Shem's descendants would have the mitzvah of Atalus with tzitzes. So you see, there are two different sources, you could say. One focuses on the string, and the other one focuses on the garment. And that's the crux of the, of the argument between Korach and Moses concerning the talus. The talus is what envelops you, it wraps you around. The tzitzes are individualistic. There are two different influences that are needed in our lives. One influence is is the talus influence, the encompassing influence. Living in a good neighborhood, for example, being in a good atmosphere, let the aura that surrounds you protect you, influence you, inspire you, and keep you secure, spiritually secure. That's an external thing. Like the talus is external. It, it, you wrap it around. The tzitzes being individual strands represents the internal influence. You can't always rely on being in a good environment. Sure, that's very important. That's very positive. Korach felt the environment is what counts. He felt the fact that the Jewish people collectively represent this very powerful force 
God enveloped them with holiness. What did Korach say? We all heard the Ten Commandments. We were standing on the Mount Sinai. What was Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai, it says in the Talmud, was the mountain that God uprooted and suspended it over the heads of the Jewish people and said, if you accept the Torah, fine. If you don't, you're going to remain there. And Hasidic thought explains that this is the mountain of love. God showered them with love. He en- encompassed them. He en- enveloped them. He encircled them with his love and passion. And they were all influenced and they're all spiritual, Korach argued. They're all holy. And as far as internalizing that holiness, they had holiness within them as well. As he said, Betocham Hashem, within them is God. So why do they need a Moses to inspire them? They had this enveloping aura, and they had this internal, natural love for God and feeling for God. And Moses says, no, no, you, you can't rely on that. You have to have individual inspiration. You have to have a mentor, someone who could relate to you individually, someone who could fortify you, someone who could nourish you and nurture you. Another point about Korach. There's an enigmatic medrash that said that what did Korach see What did Korach see? Why did he start this rebellion at this point? So the Midrash says, enigmatically, he saw the section of the Torah that deals with the Para Aduma, the red cow. We're going to read that next week. So there's a certain juxtaposition of the two narratives. The red cow was intended for a person who had come in contact with the dead, They become ritually unclean, they can't enter the temple, they can't partake of sacrifices, the Kohen cannot eat the truma, the tithe, produce, until they go through a purification rite, which involves a red cow, which is slaughtered, then the flesh is burnt and is diluted with spring water and with certain plants, it's sprinkled on the person on the third day and on the seventh day. This is called an enigmatic commandment, but there are reasons given for it nevertheless. One of the reasons given, that Rashi quotes, is that it was an atonement for the, red, for the gold ca- golden calf. When the Jews worshipped the golden calf, it contaminated them. The atonement is the red cow. The cow is the mother, the calf is the child, and, Ra- and Rashi gives the, the uh, analogy, just like when the child messes up, who cleans up the mess? The mother here too. We, we made a mess with the golden calf, and the red cow ritual is the mother that cleans up that mess. And what, what did Korach see that motivated him to rebel? What he saw was that red cow. What exactly does that mean? What does a red cow have to do with, 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 his, whole, with his whole rebellion? So there's one very interesting explanation that the defense that the Jewish people had for the golden calf, Rashi quotes, is that Moses said that, you know what, the people, what they did was terrible, was wrong, there's no question, but they did not violate the commandment, one of the Ten Commandments, don't have any other gods. Because if you look into the text of the Torah, that commandment is phrased in the singular, Who was God talking to? He was talking to me, not to the people. The people did not get the commandment directly. They got it through Moses. So you can't blame them for violating the commandment they got from God because they didn't get it from God. They got it from me. Now, of course, the truth of the matter is that was only a defense to save the Jews, but obviously God intended for every single Jew to feel that God was speaking to him or her individually. But Moses used this as a defense, saying, well, the people misunderstood. They heard you say in the singular, and you were talking to me, so they didn't feel it was that crucial. That was the defense. But what did Korach say? Korach said, no, God is within everyone. 
They all heard the Ten Commandments. Korach didn't agree with that defense. If that's the case, if Korach didn't agree with the defense, then he was exposing the Jewish people to the fact that they didn't have an atonement for the golden calf. They were now more vulnerable. By his very argument that trying to praise the Jewish people, God is within all of them because they all heard the commandments, he was exposing them to greater punishment because it means that they violated a direct commandment that God directed to them. So Korah had to find another explanation, another source of their atonement. So Korah says, oh, Parah Duma, the red cow, that's an atonement for them. If that's an atonement for them, then we don't need the defense that Moses used, that God only spoke to Moses. They had a, another defense. They, even though they didn't have a defense, they had an atonement, the red cow, and that's fine. One other explanation is that the, the red cow was an atonement for the golden calf. Moses was the one chosen by God to be the leader of the Jewish people, to bring them the Torah. And Korach, how could Korach feel justified in attacking Moses, of all people, rebelling against Moses? He was not foolish. And the answer is, he felt that Moses was diminished after the golden calf. In fact, that's what the Torah says. When God tells Moses that the people had worshipped the golden calf, God says to Moses, Raid, go down. And Rashi explains it doesn't just mean physically go down the mountain. It meant you are now being demoted because your greatness was given to you because of the people. If I'm angry at the people, then you don't need that status that you have as the leader. So Moses was reduced, was diminished as a result of the golden calf. So that's why Korah felt that Moses no longer had the authority to maintain that his interpretation is the exclusive interpretation. There's no other way you can't argue with Moses. No, you could argue with Moses. If something you hear directly from God, you can't argue about that. But if it's about interpretation, then there's room for other interpretations, Korach argued. So if Moses has his interpretation, fine, he's entitled to it. I'm entitled to mine. If Moses would have still maintained the same status as he had before, then Korach could not argue with, with Moses, even if it's a matter of interpretation. But if Moses was demoted, he felt, I don't have that block on my ability to give interpretation. And therefore he felt that he could maintain the role of high priest, that it was not right, that Moses chose Aaron, and so on and so forth. This one will conclude on one note. Korach was swallowed up and his cohorts. And our sages tell us that these people in Gehenna, in the nether place, the hot place, which Judaism exists as a place of refinement, of purification, that's where the filth that acquired, is acquired by virtue of sin is cleansed. So Gehenna is not a punishment only. Gehenna is a purification process. At any rate, Korach and his cohorts in Gehenna are proclaiming constantly, Moshe emes, Moshe is true, Torah emes, his Torah, his teachings are true, Vanachnu badoyin, we are the imposters, we are the fakers, we are the liars. Well, the simple meaning is that in the next world, everyone recognizes the truth, and they recognize that Moses was 100% true, and everything he said was was from God, and our rebelling against him was misguided. So there's a humorous way of looking at this. And it's explained by way of a parable. There's a community that was run by a very wealthy man, Jewish community, but he was a tyrant. He used his wealth and his power that he acquired through wealth to terrorize his co-religionists. He did everything in his power to make people's lives miserable, and he was the most hated and feared person in the community because he, he literally made people's lives miserable. People lost their jobs because if you crossed him, you were finished. But now he has a daughter of marriageable age, 
and he wanted to marry her to a nice young man, and of course no one in the community would ever want to have his, her son marry a daughter of this tyrant, of this evil man. So he had to go to another city far away, and introducing himself as a Jewish community leader, a wealthy man, he made a nice presentation. So of course the people of that community said, uh, they, they, they introduced him to a young man, a very uh, virtuous young man, a scholar, and it was a shidduch, a very nice match that was made, but the people said, one second, before we, before we finish this match and we complete it, we want to consult with the rabbi of the community to see, uh, to have some, we want some references, and obviously the rabbi would be the greatest reference. He knew that was going to happen, so before he went to the other city, he visits the rabbi and he tells the rabbi, you know what, you're going to get a visit probably from people from another community. They're going to ask about me. Rabbi, what are you going to say? What are you going to say about me? And the rabbi says, oh, I'm going to give them a glowing report that you're the nicest person in the world. You're the most kind person. You're the most respected person. You're a gentleman and a scholar. And he went on and on. And he says, Rabbi, you're a smart man. So sure enough, the family of that young man comes to the rabbi and they start asking about this rich tyrant. And the rabbi says everything he promised he would say. He's a gentleman, he's a wonderful person, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's, he's sweet, he's a scholar. And they were so impressed with all these qualities. They never heard anyone had so many qualities. But as they were leaving, the rabbi said, I want to just tell you something about myself. Before I was telling you about this man, I'm the biggest liar on two feet. <laughs> they tell a similar story with someone who was writing about what, how life was like and what, li what life was like in the Soviet Union. And the man said all the great things. We have freedom. We can do whatever we want. We have wealth. We have prosperity. And then he would add, but I'm a big liar. What is the point of this? It's a pretty negative insight, but the point is that sometimes wicked people, even when they realize that they were wrong, they can't get themselves to admit it. So even though they said, Moses is true, Moses is true, his teachings are true, but we are liars, we don't really mean it. That's a commentary about how sometimes we can't get rid of our own egos insistence that whatever we did was good and right and we always try to justify it it takes a lot of ethical and moral courage for us to say you know what we were wrong in last week's portion the people who rebelled against moses telling them don't go up after the debacle with the spies a group of people wanted to go to israel and they confessed their sins they said we sinned and Moses says, don't go, and they were all killed. Well, why did Moses not want them to go? Why did God not want them to go? After all, they did tshuva, they repented. But if you look at what they said, I believe this comes from the Baal Shem Tov, if, if you look at what they said, is that the tshuva was not totally sincere. What did they say? We are ready to go up to the place which God spoke about, for we have sinned. Well, there's another way of translating that verse. We are ready to go up to the place which God said that we have sinned. That means, in Hebrew, it, you can translate it either way, that they were saying, we are ready to go to that place, for God, and they didn't say, for we have sinned. For God said that we have sinned. In other words, they were saying, we don't feel that we sinned. God said so, so we'll take God at his word. Very often you hear people who did some bad things to others, and they insulted, they harmed others, and they're confronted, and they say, I apologize. If I hurt you, if I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. That's not considered true tshuva, true repentance. Because they're saying is, I didn't do anything wrong. I am innocent. If you feel that I did something wrong, then I'm sorry. That's a conditional 
expression of regret if I am guilty. In other words, you're allowing yourself the benefit of the doubt that you may not be guilty, and therefore your regret, your remorse, your contrition is compromised. And that's the lesson that we have to recognize, that when we want to do tshuva, we have to come before God and say, God, yes, we sinned. That's it. No no buts. No, we sinned, and we're not going to add, but we had a reason why we sinned. It's not totally our fault. When you judge someone else, you always try to find the good and defense for that person and not add the but. You always try to, 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 to show that the person was innocent. But when you're judging yourself, you have to be brutally honest and accept full responsibility. And when we accept full responsibility, then we are truly absolved of our sins and the sins can be transformed into mitzvahs and that power that our sages tell us when we do tshuva, it brings redemption. Everyone should have a good week.